Suffer both to grow until the harvest. For it's taken from our Holy Gospel today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Why does God let the wicked grow side by side with the good? Today we will consider two reasons. The first, to make us better. The second, to make them better. To the first. The wicked are a trial, a test, a cross for the good. They give the good the best opportunity to, for the exercise of charity, charity which is the basis of all virtue. It is hard to love your enemies if you don't have any. How would you know if your love is sincere if everyone likes you? The most perfect love is disinterested love, love for those who do not do us good. If you love those who do good to you, what value is that, as our Lord says? It is good to love those in general who hate you in a general way, like the Muslims. But it is harder to, to love those who hate you specifically, who intentionally harm you specifically, and who aren't sorry for it. But is this not how God loves us? If it were not, then there would be no incarnation and certainly no crucifixion. And even if we were perfect, like our blessed mother Mary, the wicked would help us to love as God loves. But we are not perfect. So, in addition, God also uses the wicked, wicked for our correction, for the destruction of our pride and our growth in humility. Consider King David who, when he was fleeing from one of his sons, was stoned by Shemeh. But in response to being stoned, a king, being stoned by this man, says, Let him alone, and let him curse. For the Lord hath bid him curse David, and who is he that shall dare say, Why hath he done so? How many sins do we seem to have gotten away with? How many times did we receive benefits and even praise for things that were in reality quite sinful? Gossiping, cheating, revenge. There are many things, especially, that the world considers praiseworthy and not sinful, like impure desires and pursuits, or enticing those desires and pursuits, drunkenness, indulgence. How often, then, do we escape, or did we escape, our due punishment. But there must be justice. Every idle word will be accounted for. We can either get our just deserts in this life or in the next. Thus, it is a mercy of God that he permits us to suffer for our sins in this life. And are we to complain if he uses others for that purpose? Someone tears you down with speech to your face. How many times have you boasted, raised yourself up by your own speech? You are detracted. They spoke badly about me when I wasn't around. But how often have you gossiped of others? Someone doesn't give you the respect you deserve. But what of all the times you failed to give God the respect that he deserves? But it is not just for a correction. God lets the wicked grow close to us to help us grow in humility and also for the exercise of his own providence. Consider Joseph the patriarch who has ended up, ended up being made a savior of the Jews all because of the evil done to him by his brothers. Very jealous of him, they sold him into slavery and all these horrible things to him. But it was because of the evil that God let happen to him that he was able to save them all. At the very end of Genesis, when uh, his brothers are very afraid, Jacob is dead and the brothers are afraid that, that now Joseph is going to come out and get vengeance upon them for how badly they treated him. He tells them, You thought evil against me, but God turned it into good, that he might exalt me, as at present you see, and might save many people. Let us go to the second reason, then, the main reason, that God lets 
The wicked grow up with the good. That is so that the wicked may become better. We must recognize, too, it is both a mercy and a justice that God lets the wicked live as long as he does, that they may have all the opportunities they need to convert or to reform. How are they to do that if they have no contact with God's chosen instruments? They are close to the good, therefore, that the good may rub off on them. It's the job of the good to win sinners over with virtue. This is done in two ways, through correction and through suffering. We must correct the sinner that we have authority over, be they our children, our employees, or even our friends and equals, to the degree that the latter permit us. For it is often relatively pointless to correct someone who neither cares what you think nor has any need to obey you. But today at least, let us consider this more second way which is always applicable. We cannot always correct sinners, but we can always suffer them by sacrifice and patience. Think of the wicked in your life as weeds, as thorny weeds with sharp, unpleasant spines. Now, if you cannot correct them from authority, they can only be made good by you rubbing off on them. But how will that feel for the good to rub up against those spiny weeds? Thus one must have patience and make sacrifice, which should come as no surprise, as this is how God has saved us all. Some practical considerations. The weed who needles you, that person who provokes you, what will happen? Either you will grow spines and needle them back, or eventually, God willing, you will take his spines away by bearing them with charity. Think of that expression, trading barbs with someone, and how true that is. How often we are tempted to respond in kind. This just makes us weeds like them. We are disappointed in ourselves afterwards. We realize, ah, why did I do that? Why did I say that? By responding to anger with anger, insults with insults, we ourselves become barbed and spiny, thinking that we will thus defend ourselves against the weeds, but in reality, doing so we just become weeds ourselves. We might even take this as a good definition of friendship, that a friend is one who makes you less thorny, not necessarily one who likes you better, or who you like better. Some people are fun to be around, but they actually make us worse, not better. But if through God's grace the weeds in your life make you less of a weed yourself, are they not really your friends be kept close to you, lest you grow in pride, and so on? Again, what is often needed is patience and sacrifice, especially for those we have no duty to correct. Remember the crown of thorns. We are all weeds for Christ. Our sins are the thorns piercing his sacred skin. Finally, I invite you to consider an image that I at least find quite helpful. The relic of the true cross. I have mentioned the relics on the altar today. Um, I do not have a relic of the true cross. I would really like one. So if you have any, please give me one. But how much would we like to have a relic of the true cross? It would be wonderful. Or we would venerate it. We'd put it up on a, on a high pedestal, and like candles around it. It would be our most prized possession. But when you look at relics of the true cross, you'll see the relic of the true cross is just a splinter, really. And perhaps you already have a splinter of the cross in your life. Is this not the true cross? Should you not have as much reverence for it? So, prayer and the sacraments. When we have a weed growing right next to us, we need time in prayer and the graces of the sacraments to see how God is using him for our own penance and perfection, and how God wants to use us, our patience and our sacrifice for the sinner's good. Then God's will may be accomplished in us both. 
we shall become more humble, more like Christ, and the sinner may be converted. And then we shall both become good and rejoice in heaven together with our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.